Databases. A database seminar series at Carnegie Mellon University is recorded in front of a live studio audience. Funding for this program is made possible by Ottertune. Google. Hi guys, thank you for coming to another uh, data seminar talk from uh, at Carnegie Mellon. We're excited today to have Ken Gibbs. Um, he's a legend in, in the database community, uh, someone who's worked on a many, many important projects over several years. Uh, he was worked on the, the rewrite of SQL Server back at Microsoft in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, he joined Amazon and, and worked on building out Aurora, building out Redshift. Uh, he's done a, a lot of amazing things. Um, and so he's here to talk about a, a side project he did while also still at Amazon on a, uh, a database platform called Gaia. Which is he, he's informed me has been, just been open source, it's available on GitHub. Uh, so we'd like to hear his his thoughts and ideas about something he built that like thought it couldn't be done with MySQL and Postgres for, for robots. So uh, as always, if you have any questions for Ken Gibbs as he's giving his talk, please unmute yourself, say who you are, and fire away at any time so that he's you know he's talking, it's a conversation for him and not him just talking to a screen for an hour. Um so Ken Gibbs, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Uh thank you. Uh, you, you're. It was too good. Thank you very much. I don't know if I deserve deserved it, but thank you. Oh come on, please. All right. Go so, um, so my name is Tengiz. I'm originally from the uh, Soviet Union, and my um, original training was in physics. So I, I, I was studying physics first, the theoretical physics, then. Um, then I switched to something else, but again, it was a hardcore physics. And, and um, how in, in the I ended up building databases. So it's a, it, it's been a long way for me because um, how do you go from theoretical physics to databases? And again, it's simple. If your country collapses, you need to find something else. If 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 it if whatever you uh, uh, thought would be your career does not feed your family, you need to do something else. And I, I was um, lucky enough while uh, building my uh, instruments for my uh, research, excuse me, let me switch to my slides. Um, I, I was lucky enough to uh, have worked on uh, software engineering as well. So. This is one of those big research vessels that Soviet Union used to have. And uh, a, a vessel like this would be used to do a research in deep ocean. What we did is uh, we um, researched the phenomena of uh, sound wave propagation um, and everything related to it, which underwater is pretty complex because the underwater, uh, the conditions in ocean are very different from atmosphere because it's it's essentially layered. And the I mean I'm not going to bother you with, with these details, but one of the things that I did I um, I built instruments for our research because many of those things most of those things are actually unique. So you you need to run an experiment and there is no equipment for it. You need to build it. So that's why that's how I got exposed to hardware engineering first, and then the software engineering. And I did, I also did a lot of DSP in order to do because otherwise you won't be able to produce maps like this, for instance, in real time. And again, it was the 80s, and we used to have really small computers. They were not very powerful, and uh, we did not have. Uh, uh, we could not request more powerful hardware, um, and. It was pretty much, so this is what you get and go ahead and build it. And I had to write the code using uh, uh, machine instructions in many cases. And it was a uh, um, quite a good uh, learning experience for me. Uh, <clears throat> also, these experiments, they produced a lot of data. So we had to store and manipulate this data somehow. So that's how I got exposed to very rudimentary notion of data of a database. So it was all uh, uh, built from scratch back then by us. Um, but it was, I mean, you can't compare it with modern databases. Anyway, so I got exposed to databases. Then I, uh, I somehow learned a little bit of SQL, right? And I was amazed that, okay, by the fact that 
the language, the language interface is quite different from your procedural programming, right? And uh, that's when I got the taste of the uh, declarative programming, and I really, I really liked it. So uh, the two opposites, the really low level programming uh, uh, that you need to do if you want to uh, want to build something based on uh, uh, high performance DSP, and on on the other hand, uh, highly abstract uh, things that allow you to optimize your computational uh, algorithm on the fly, these two things always uh, started really, really fascinated me. And in the end, I mean, that's how I ended up uh, in SQL Server because I did one big project using SQL Server engine back then. And again, it was 1990s and I learned uh, how to use SQL Server and I learned a lot about its internals. And that's when I got offer from Microsoft and I, I built, uh, 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 so I built many uh, critical parts of uh, uh, SQL Server. And then I ended up in Aurora and it was uh, another great project. And I was, uh, I've been blessed to, um, to be in Aurora from the very beginning, and I architected big uh, pieces of it, and I, again, I enjoyed it very much. And then, when the opportunity, it was a chance uh, for me, a pure chance. Uh, a former colleague of mine, who with whom I worked both at Amazon and at Microsoft, he founded. He was a founder of a, uh, a little company, Gaia Platform. And uh, what they wanted to do was somewhat unusual, and it kind of, uh, uh, it was in the, I mean, one thing that was different about Gaia, it, it had both of those things, low level, uh, uh, um, uh, really low level programming, the requirement for low level programming. And of course, we wanted, we want databases everywhere now because databases are enormously successful and important platform now, right? So, and they wanted to build a uh, software platform for autonomous machines, various kinds of autonomous machines. Like if you take, I don't know, uh, a self-flying taxi or a robot uh, or surgical robot or um, any other piece of equipment that, that needs to work in an autonomous fashion. So not only uh, <clears throat> very little input from a human, if any, plus it should be able to work uh, in an environment when there is no online connectivity, right? And uh, the idea was that, so we built, we provide the platform that on one hand allows you to really do high level things like artificial intelligence and uh, computer vision in order to inform, in order to uh, build the picture of the environment where your device operates and also software platform in order to allow you to express uh, the essence of what your device is doing using uh, using software constructs that, uh, that are specifically built um, in order to facilitate this kind of this kind of development. I'm sorry, I, I realized I didn't say it well. There is an essence of what your program does and there is an actual implementation, right? So, and if you have a software tool that is um, very, um, um, that is not purposefully, uh, that is not built well, built well for what you're doing, then you, 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 will, you will get lost in details. C++, C and C++ are excellent languages. However, they are way too detailed for many things. And, the uh, and of course the the area of computer language design is a huge area and it uh, has always been uh, so and I mean one might say that it was way too ambitious to actually try to do something meaningful here um, but that that's what the founders wanted and when they also told me that they wanted this whole thing to be based on a uh, so the foundation of the whole thing uh, was going to be a database, a very interesting database. First of all, um, unlike normal uh, databases, they, what they wanted to uh, build is a platform that has uh, certain properties, like for instance, no copy. 
and no data cracking. Uh, normally, if, when you store a record in a database, it's stored in a format that is highly optimized for the storage. Uh, you want it to be as compact as possible. You want it to be very flexible, the format, so that you can accommodate any kind of table shapes and so forth. And it usually means that in order to crack a record, uh, the algorithms to crack a record are quite complicated because you need to take into account which record is nullable, which record is of variable length, which records can be stored uh, out of row if it's a large object or something like that. And it, in the end, you get a quite complicated format for the data record. In SQL Server, I would say that it was one of the uh, one of the complicated things, and we never. Uh, so we always wanted to change that part of the engine to, uh, in order to, to speed things up because this uh, process of cracking the record is very iterative and it's driven by schema, of course, and you do it in the runtime. Uh, we, want, we, we experimented with code gen generation for record cracking, but uh, it went nowhere because we didn't really have time for other things that were more important. So this project, looked like something that, okay, so let's let's try and solve this problem. And the solution was that the layout of the record is something that your program can understand directly. You don't need an API to crack a record. I mean, you do, but very little of it. We chose as the format, the uh, Google's flood buffer and uh, the, the, uh, uh, the API to crack the flood buffer is open. It's it's pretty simple. Uh, there is nothing very complicated. Um, it and it's very efficient as well. So uh, this is one thing. You never need to run anything complicated or or, or anything that you uh, uh, you cannot understand, right? So this is how you crack the record. This is one thing. Another thing is that. Uh, client server databases, for instance, there is a necessary part where you, your data gets copied. You don't have direct access to the data in your database. So you issue a query, the engine uh, um, uh, finds the data, packages it, and sends it back to you. So even if you don't, even if your client and the server are, uh, are on the same instance, still, you usually go through multiple layers of functions uh, in order to retrieve the record and you get a copy of the record, not the record itself, right? Um, there is also a very um, annoying part that you need to somehow uh, solve the problem of the impedance mismatch because between your favorite programming language and the database API, all these uh, boring things like uh, uh, column bindings and so forth, and then the indicators, which column is there, which isn't, and so forth. So there is a lot of stuff that is happening between, uh, uh, on the way uh, uh, for the data, from the database to the application and vice versa. And, and the idea was to eliminate all of it. So you expose the data in your database directly in memory to your applications. Applications can, crack the records directly. Uh, the database supports um, a pointer data type so that you can have complicated data structures. You can have graphs, trees, whatever. Um, and all of it also uh, with transactional consistency. So if you, when you access your data, it's all transactionally consistent. You don't see uh, effects of uh, partial transactions. Uh, you um, never, if you, you can roll back your transactions, if the transaction is not uh, committed, no one else will see any result of it. Uh, the data, your data is persisted, like in a normal database, and you get all of it and you essentially pay almost nothing for it. The only thing that we ask you to do is to run uh, uh, a few magic methods, like, like you, uh, you connect to the database, you, I'm sorry, you connect to the platform, let's not call it a database. You uh, start a transaction, um, you call an API that uh, retrieves, let's say the root of your graph, and then you crack the graph directly and then start navigating again. Then you run your, your algorithm and the view of the data as it's supposed to be in databases, 
is frozen for you, frozen in the sense that you don't see the effects of other transactions. So, um, and this, to me, this looked like something uh, that I really wanted to do for a lo very long time, something like this. Uh, there have been this, uh, uh, of course, there has been research in the transactional memory, uh, software transactional me memory, uh, uh, hybrid transactional memory, hardware transactional memory. But I don't know if there is anything practical that uh, um, I could just go ahead and use. I don't want to use the database uh, uh, with its traditional SQL interface, or even if it's not a SQL interface, if it's an object relational mapping, still there is there are some things that I'm supposed to do before I can actually get to the data and so forth, right? I mean, so, this, this sounds like the object-oriented databases from like the late 80s, early 90s, like yes. O2, Versant, right? Yes, it does. So, uh, but we know that they, unfortunately they were not very successful. I mean, they are not they are not around anymore. Correct. So one of the one of the reasons why they aren't uh, uh, is that the uh, because many of them were based on the uh, uh, hardware pro on the properties of the hardware. I mean, they were based on some notion of a page fault, and when you wanted to retrieve an object, uh, uh, it would trigger a page fault, and then you would need to make sure that you you, you will provide the uh, uh, payload at the memory location that was requested. And it was a, a lot of data, a lot of uh, page faults and a lot of data movement. And um, it was somewhat slower than people wanted. One of the reasons. So there, there were other reasons, I'm sure. But one of the reasons that I can see is, that is exactly this. So and uh, now the question is, can we do it better than the uh, than good old databases of the 80s and, and 90s, right? Object databases. And what we ended up building is something that tries to minimize the uh, overhead of uh, uh, associated with this um, with anything that causes uh, uh, page faults and anything that would need to move a lot of data around in order to create an illusion that you, your data is actually where, you, where your pointer uh, uh, points to, right? So, and I'm sorry, I, I forgot to advance the slide. So this is going back to the motivation. This is one of the potential targets for uh, the platform, right? So this is a Komatsu uh, autonomous uh, uh, excavator. It's an huge uh, expensive machine and uh, they were experimenting with our platform, Komatsu. Um, this is another example of the Gaia platform uh, in, in real life, so to speak. So uh, it was a, this was a first autonomous um, uh, car race. It was a year ago or so, and this is the uh, race car that was uh, controlled by uh, Gaia platform software. Um, anyway, so let's just for a second uh, leave it here. So, and I would argue that what we built it tries to minimize the overhead of this uh, the, uh, of the memory management. Right, because page faults are expensive, and if you need to, uh, if you need to pretend that your objects are where your pointer points to, there is a lot of movement of data. Right. So, uh, but before I before I uh, talk about it in detail, I mean just a couple of thoughts about databases. So, two things, in my opinion, that makes databases so. Uh, great is that the fact that the front end, uh, the, the, so they solve the optimization problem of uh, accessing and manipulating your data, right? So, and it's a, a highly declarative uh, way. And uh, it's, it's one of the most successful platforms that ever did anything like this, right? And another thing that, that uh, the, the, the second part of the database magic is of course the transactions. Because transactions make it possible to uh, to make it seem like parallel programming is easy. The whole point of uh, uh, transactions 
is to give you an illusion that you can write serial programs in a parallel environment, right? And uh, uh, this is this is one of the those things that database make databases great. And arguably, and I don't know if um, I have any counter example, databases are the most successful parallel programming platform. There are other pro parallel programming platforms, of course, but there is nothing that is nowhere near the simplicity of databases, right? And uh, uh, so, but when you write uh, uh, code in C and C++, it, for, for me, since I, I mean, I've used databases and I build databases and uh, obviously we write database code, the, the actual systems we, we, we write using lower level languages. And there was always uh, this feeling, I mean, it was, it, it, there is this dissatisfaction that on one hand, we create this uh, uh, wonderful illusion that allows you to simplify parallel program, but we can't use it inside the database because we have to do all those things uh, uh, by hand, so to speak. So all this uh, um, uh, highly efficient synchronization uh, and concurrent access patterns, all of those things in order to, uh, but, we, but we have to do it by hand. We can't do much, uh, um, we can't use much. Um, the tools that we use since we want to achieve the maximum performance and maximum efficiency, maximum scalability and so forth, we cannot afford any um, higher level tools. Uh, but I always wanted to, uh, uh, I always thought that if I had an environment that would give me just transactional memory, everything else I'll take care of. Um, it would be a great step forward and it would be a, a really good simplification for me. Because uh, if I if I know how to think in terms of transactions, and if the platform give, platforms gives me transactions, it's re very easy. It's much easier for me to write programs because at least one thing I don't need to worry about the parallelism, right? And uh, uh, so the Gaia platform, one thing that it does, not only you access memory uh, and all those all those good properties that I described. But since it's transaction, it also gives you the very transparent notion of parallelism. You, the application developer, even using low le lower level language uh, uh, like C or C, like C, C++, you can uh, enjoy transactional access to your data. And it simplifies a lot of things. And for me, it was this, this combination of the two things. So it's a lower level, low, relatively low level platform, low level in the sense that uh, the original, uh, uh, so whatever we built so far, it does not have a SQL interface. At least it does not have a direct SQL interface. It is possible to access the Gaia database using Postgres, uh, but it's uh, but the the Gaia platform itself does not have any query language yet. Um, we 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 had plans to add query language query language later, but as of now, if you look at the code, there is no query language. So. But we still wanted these two things, transactions and uh, uh, declarative uh, uh, and declarative access, right? So, and I'm sure everyone knows what the uh, Microsoft link is. And um, it's an attempt to bring something like uh, the, the power, something akin to SQL power to the uh, uh, to the normal programming language, right? So the original promise of and this is just an example of of the object notation in link, and this is the so-called SQL comprehension. Um, if you are used to SQL, this looks very natural to you. And um, I mean, I would I would also say that there was uh, uh, this. Um, uh, this, the programming tool that used to be called embedded SQL, I don't think it's it's as hot now as it used to be. Um, but this is an attempt to do something like embedded SQL used to do in a way that is just embedded in the language, right? Um, anyway, so this was one of the inspirations for the Gaia platform. 
So uh, we have the uh, uh, .NET link, Microsoft link. There is also Java Streams uh, framework, which kind of solves similar, uh, um, addresses similar set of challenges. Um, one thing though, I must say that I, so to me, Link was is somewhat a disappointment because originally it promised to, um, originally it promised to do more than it's capable doing now. For instance, you take this, either this expression or this expression, and the promise was that if you use the, without making any changes in the source, if you replace the so-called uh, um, provider, data provider, then the, the uh, advanced data providers uh, can take this expression and before running it, they would be also be able to optimize it. Optimize it using the optimization techniques that like typical for databases, for instance. Uh, you, uh, so first of all, of course, it's all sch schema driven and statistics driven, right? Um, but unfortunately, I I'm not aware of any link provider that actually does it. I mean, yes, there is the link to SQL uh, uh, driver, and then yet yeah, the optimization does happen in the in the database, but the original promise was that it doesn't matter if you actually have a database behind your link expression or not. Even if it's in memory link provider, uh, uh, the promise was that the architecture and the framework allows you to have a link providers that can do the optimization, but I'm not aware of any. So, for Gaia platform, one of the goals was to be able to do something like this. So we introduced uh, um, a, our um, dialect of C++, we call it declarative C++. There isn't, there isn't not much in it yet. Uh, I don't know if it's gonna be evolving dramatically or not, but it has some elements, uh, some good elements of link. Um, it's uh, and it's somewhat um, tries to bring together the best of databases with the ease of programming using just general purpose uh, high level language, right? Um, it's schema driven. Uh, you just go ahead and uh, create uh, a schema for your uh, database. And this is just an example of scripts that they creates a database, uh, a couple of tables for you. Um, it's pretty much no different than, than SQL, except this thing. And this is how uh, the uh, uh, links between objects uh, are created. So in this example, I have uh, two tables, uh, um, uh, building and room and each each room belongs to some building and uh, this um, uh, this statement, it creates a relationship between building and room. So each building can have multiple rooms. It's one to many relationship. And uh, uh, each uh, room has a link to a building. So it's a two way relationship. Room to building is uh, uh, many to one and building to rooms is one to many. And this syntax, I mean, we debated a lot about how we, how exactly we do this syntax. Originally it looked pretty much like declarative referential integrity in databases, but uh, uh, many engineers with the background with no database background, they didn't like it. So we just, I think we borrowed it. I don't remember which system um, it uses a similar syntax. And um, and there are other little syntactical things that I'm not gonna talk about. Just, I'm, I'm just trying to give you the, the essence of it and the spirit of it. So this is one element uh, of, of the programming. Another element is that uh, we have so-called rules. A rule is an action gets triggered by a data change. So it's very similar to a database trigger or it's very similar to event uh, programming. 
The difference uh, uh, between these and database triggers, for instance, database triggers are uh, databases uh, provide triggers that run in the context of the transaction that, that actually did the change, right? So um, in Gaia platform, it's not like that. So although we had plans to add database triggers that work in the context of transaction that did the change, but the, the triggers that are implemented, they are post commit. So uh, only if you commit, only then the uh, uh, the uh, the rules, the rule code, the rule logic gets triggered. And again, so we did a little bit. It's a, a dialect of C plus plus. What we do is, uh, for instance, this thing. It's it means that it's an active field. Uh, which means that is uh, when the front end language front front end detects uh, uh, the add sign, it knows that okay. So although we didn't explicitly say that this trigger, this rule gets triggered by the change of vehicle entering, it's a um, it's a field in a table scum. Uh, this the add sign means that uh, implicitly we automatically generate code that triggers this rule every time this thing changes. Uh, although we didn't explicitly anywhere in the rule, we didn't, we never said there is a, another syntax that says on change, on update, on insert, on delete, and so forth. So this is one thing. Um, uh, I think that's it. There are no more elements. There are elements in the syntax that also el automatically allow you to navigate from the, uh, navigate between the um, entities that, have relationships like this. For instance, um, uh, there is a syntax that allows you to go from building to a room and from a room, if, if room has uh, a relationship with something else, then uh, the path from building to whatever room references is also automatic. So you don't need to, you don't actually need to specify um, the exact path between the related objects, the system will figure it out. If there is a uh, unambiguous single route from related from related object, even if even though when they are, the the relationship is not just direct relationship, uh, the system figures it out and generates the code that automatic automatically does all of those things. A great, uh, question for, qu question from the audience from Alex. You want to unmute yourself? Uh, sure. Yeah, I just didn't want to interrupt. Uh, uh, but um, what was the motivation for you mentioned, if I heard it right, that the rules are uh, handled post commit. And then I was just curious what the motivation was versus you were comparing it to more traditional databases where in, uh, triggers, for example, are akin to triggers. They are done within a commit or, or a mm -hmm. transaction, I guess, a logical transaction. Thanks. Yeah. So the the uh, the the triggers that are traditional database triggers uh, there are two two groups of two large types of um, triggers one is the triggers that help you to maintain constraints triggers that validate something right uh, and another kind of trigger if you need to do a cascading action right so you um, you insert something into one table and you need to make sure that some other action happens in another table and it's all transactionally consistent. So this is what you normally do in databases. The, uh, the post commit trigger is more like uh, a feature of the so-called rules engines, right? Or decision engines, because uh, the logic there uh, is is different. So a transaction is something that uh, is, that has happened. So if there is a, a sensor and you get a reading from the sensor and you register it, it's something that al that already has happened, mm -hmm. and uh, it cannot be taken back. So it's I don't know if I if I'm explaining it well, but it's it, it's just different use cases. Mm, one I use case it, yeah. is mm -hmm. one use case is that yeah. when you need to maintain some constraint, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and when I said that cascading actions, 
And cascading action is also a part of your uh, a higher level constraint. Right, yeah. Like for instance, I insert a transaction in, I insert the record, the transaction record in my uh, general ledger, and it automatically updates, then it automatically updates the balances on the accounts uh, involved mm -hmm. in, the, mm -hmm. in the transaction. That's a typical transactional uh, trigger. Mm -hmm. Because you don't you don't want to create a situation when you have a record mm -hmm. of a transaction that is committed and the balance balances are not updated. For instance, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is different. This is post facto. The event already yeah. happened. I need to react yeah. to it. Yeah, yeah. I, I get it. Sometimes you don't want to be dependent on the on the result. You may or may not be dependent on the result of the of the prior data event or data transaction. I think I think that's the use case that I'm hearing from. Okay, thanks. Yeah, right. I got it. Yeah. Okay, so, um, and um, again, so one element is the DDL. You create a, you, you, you inform the database of the shape of your objects, although we call them all tables, but table is a collection of objects of the shape that you specify, right? Uh, there is this uh, uh, rule definition uh, uh, file and it has a uh, it has a syntax that is not your standard C plus plus syntax. And uh, if you really wanted to go really lo low level, then this is how it would look like. For instance, in one of the earlier implementations of the system, if you wanted to just directly access your database, and this code, I mean, we provide all the classes, of course, the base the, the basic classes, but this code, I mean. I, I, I didn't want to. Uh, uh, I didn't want to bother with you with a lot of code. But this code, if you look at the implementation, is actually very simple and very straightforward. It it directly manipulates the memory, right? That um, the memory that is set up for your uh, transaction when you uh, when you call this method. What happens is that in the virtual memory is created a special range of uh, uh, pages. That is, uh, that, it, that is in order to maintain the illusion for you that uh, the memory that you're looking at as a part of transaction is not affected by the changes made by other transactions. So what we do is when you say begin transaction, what you have the memory view from this moment on is, uh, is akin to snapshot isolation, right? So, and uh, this is the lowest level of it. So you just begin transaction, you do some actions, and then you, I mean, in this case, you roll back transaction. Similarly, again, this code is nothing spectacular, of course, but it's Python. And you could do it in Python as well. So originally we had two interfaces, one for C++, another one for Python. The Python one was quite handy because since the Python has this uh, interactive, um, uh, character, the Python uh, uh, application, when you run it, the actual Python executable, the, the, the Python executable itself. It has this wonderful interactive nature. You don't need to write a program, then compile it, and then execute it. You can just experiment and play with your database uh, live using Python, like, like what you would, of course, do with uh, uh, various uh, SQL clients for your database. They, they all are, I mean, every database provides some sort of interactive uh, client. You don't need to write an application. You don't even need to write a script. You just go ahead and type the statements uh, 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 one after another and see what happens, right? And Python, it was a wonderful uh, 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 option because it allowed you to do exactly this with uh, Gaia database, which gave you, which provided even more a real database-like feeling, although you were using really low-level uh, direct memory access constra constructs and so forth. So these are the elements of the uh, platform, right? And uh, uh, I spent most of the time that I spent at Gaia, I, I was doing exactly this memory model thing, right? So, and we can talk about it if we have time, but I don't know if we have time. I, we have you have 20 minutes keep going 
Ah, 20 minutes. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so yeah, let's talk about the memory model because um, I'm not uh, I'm not uh, big on the uh, language front ends and so forth. I, I, of course, I know a lot about those things, but I'm not an expert. What I'm my expertise in the storage engines and uh, transactional consistency, memory models, and, and uh, all of those in those wonderful and magical things, right? So, and okay, so this is how uh, 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 the platform works, right? So this is a layout, um, roughly the layout of the memory. And uh, there are two sections in memory, two, big, two uh, important sections. One is called record locators. And the other one is called record payload. And uh, record locator is just an array of pointers. And if I want to access this object, I first find the record locator for this object, and I follow this pointer. Um, and uh, uh, so, if I want to, if if I want to make a change, uh, for instance, if I wanted to uh, uh, add uh, an object, then my transaction also has the so-called write buffer, and this write buffer is in the area of the record payload. And when I create an object, I first create the actual object, then I create a record locator for it and set it up so that it points to the, rec to the actual record payload. So in this case, two records are created by a green transaction. So this is just the uh, uh, high level view of things, right? Um, the, um, the, this is how the applications see the memory. What happens underneath is this. So this memory that has the uh, record locators for each transaction is actually uh, uh, managed, managed by the system in the way that if you, uh, if you try to change a pointer here, your transaction, right? What happens is that it triggers the, uh, uh, it triggers the memory management it triggers the memory manager. You get your own copy. So this the the the, the top in the top uh, part of the slide. This is what the transaction. So the transaction that, that does the change. It sees this. So originally, the this last pointer was pointing to this object. It was uh, light blue. So now I changed it. I created a new version of this object. And now I my my record locator pointer, my record locator point to this. This becomes a garbage. However, it, all other transactions they can they still see this because whatever my transaction did, it does it in memory that is managed by the system in the way that other transactions. When, if I start another transaction before this transaction is committed, they still see the old pointer, right? So. And this allows you to uh, uh, run, uh, to have transactions of arbitrary length and the results of these transactions, uh, these transactions are not visible to anyone. And I can have, uh, uh, I mean, I can have the, the complete illusion of snapshot isolation, right? So this is one element of the uh, memory management. So, and by the way, this memory is not, uh, so, it's it's an expensive thing to cause a page fault because when you do copy and write, what happens underneath it actually causes a page fault. The operating system will create a private copy of the page that contains the device that you touched, and you only see your private copy. No one else will see it. However, since the memory that we need to manage like this is much smaller. I mean, we only need to manage like this, this part of the memory, which is just a record locator. It's a 64-bit it's a pointer for each object. It doesn't matter how large your object is. The only, uh, uh, we only touch 64 bytes, uh, 64 bits, I'm sorry, for each uh, object update. We never need to uh, do anything special with this memory because this memory, again, this memory, the record payload, payload is in is a, in a shared memory that is accessed can be that is accessed directly and there is no uh, uh, virtual memory special virtual memory treatment for this region for this region. Well, there is a little bit, but it has nothing to do with uh, uh, it's there is nothing expensive like uh, handling the page faults, right? 
So, uh, and the only thing, the one thing that we uh, require the applications to do is when they manipulate objects, uh, they always go through the uh, this uh, um, record locator array, right? And if you are writing, if you are writing it using writing your applications using C plus plus, the only thing that you, you the one thing that is different from if compared to if I wanted to just write write plain C plus uh, plus uh, program for this is that the object pointers are actually pointers to pointers. This is the only change, right? It's a it, it, it's a little bit of uh, uh, we will bother you with this one thing, right? So whenever you want to access an object, you are supposed to use this uh, dereferencing uh, de array, right? We manage the dereferencing array in the way that creates for you an illusion of a snapshot. Um, and since all the payload is, we ask you to only access the payload using this indirection, it also creates an illusion of a snapshot in the payload as well, right? Um, the, again, it's, so now going back to this picture. So every time my, I, I, I change an object, in this case, I change this object and this object, I create a new versions, I repoint uh, the record locators. We also capture the change log. So there is a special range in the shared memory that is called write buffer. This memory, by the way, is read only by default, right? Whenever you open a transaction, uh, the system creates the snapshot of this memory first. And of course, it's an incremental snapshot. You don't need to snapshot all of it. Uh, you just need to, we just use the operating system primitives that uh, create a private view of this memory. If you change anything in here, no one else will see it. If anyone, someone else is want, someone else wants to change, then it's done in a controlled fashion. I will talk about it a bit later. When you want to uh, uh, change an object, then the system, when you open a transaction, the system allocates a write buffer for you that your process or your thread is allowed to write to. Then you just create the, 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 the payloads for your objects here directly. You update these pointers. This change is not visible to anyone. This change is visible in the shared memory, although these blocks are not reachable because there is no pointer in the, um, there is not a single pointer in this memory that would uh, uh, point to these objects. So these objects are not reachable. Again, if you follow the rules, but the rules are very simple. So we capture the chain change log, and then uh, when your transaction needs to commit, it actually goes ahead and we, uh, whatever we captured, it goes to the central transaction uh, certifier that makes sure that there, is, there are no contradictions with other transactions. And by the way, it's snapshot isolation, not serializable. We only catch the update conflicts. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the transaction data anomalies that are, uh, uh, the, the snapshot isolation data anomalies they of course exist here. We um, we designed the system so that you could add support for serializable, but it would be uh, it would be much slower because it it uses a different way of tracking. With it uses what it uses it uses the it tracks the pages that got update that got updated and that got read as well. And it's quite expensive to do it using the stock operating system, but it's possible. And if you really want serializable, you would be able to do it. It's not in production, so to speak, in the code, but there is a way, uh, the system was designed to allow this as well. Um, anyway, let's go ahead. So, um, so in this case, these two objects got changed, and these are the new versions of the objects. This is the committed. Uh, a view of memory, both the uh, uh, record locators and the payload. And we have a list of garbage here. So these two versions are now obsolete. They might be still needed for some transactions who still have this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, record locator memory that points to this object. So it's not that the garbage collection is timed 
uh, correctly so that only only when these objects are no longer reachable, then the these objects this memory gets reclaimed. Are you are you just the, doing simple simple epochs for this, or like how are you tracking uh, what what what's, what's reclaimable? So it's a combination of epochs and uh, tracking of individual transactions as well. Got it. I okay. mean, but in essence, yes, it's epochs. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so now, so all this, all this, all this is good, but we also need persistence. And one thing about persistence is that if you really want to, I mean, at least it used to be like this, the best database systems, the persistence uh, is designed, to, uh, um, you don't, you can't really design the persistence layer without um, designing it in the way that also gives you the best concurrency in memory. So if you take the, uh, um, I mean, let me qualify this statement. This statement was true, I don't know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. The best systems, if you wanted to, uh, uh, when you were designing the in-memory concurrency protocol to access your pages, you have to do it uh, in the way that would also uh, not be in the way of your uh, 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 persistency algorithms, right? So whatever you do for your redo logging, whatever you do in order to track the undos and so forth, you have to do it in the way that does not contradict your, uh, uh, your concurrency model in memory and vice versa. And the reason for that was that, uh, again, there are multiple reasons, but the central fact here is that the layout of your data on these and the layout of your data in memory, they were exactly the same. You wanted, and it's a, it's a great simplification because uh, you, you're suddenly your page replacement algorithms are very, very simple. Just bring the page to memory uh, and you're done. You don't need to unpack anything. You don't need to do any transformations and so forth, right? Uh, but this system, the Gaia platform, is different. It's an in-memory system, in-memory meaning that you work in set fits in memory. There is, you don't need to have any page replacement. That was the requirement to the system, which means that you are free to design your uh, uh, recovery pod system, uh, recovery subsystem and recovery uh, uh, and persistence completely in the way that you like. And this is the first time that I tried it and it, it just works. I mean, whatever happens in memory does not, the memory layout here and whatever we, whatever ends up being on this, it's completely, they, they are completely unrelated. You can think of it like this. I, I, I try to formulate it in the way that you, you immediately get it. Uh, and one, one formulation that uh, I settled on is the following. We, we all know what CDC is, uh, change data tracking, change data capture, I'm sorry, right? So you, you make changes in memory and you capture the log and you send it to the, to the CDC target and the CDC target materializes it. So it is, if you think of your recovery as, as a pers and persistent as your CDC target, then suddenly you are free to design uh, the in-memory algorithms the way you want. I mean, I don't need page replacement. The only, the only time when I need to read data from disk is the database starter. I can afford doing something more complicated than just reading the page and just slapping it, it into the memory, right? It's just a startup and it happens, or it doesn't happen often. So I can I can actually uh, I can actually afford doing something slightly more complicated than copying the data from disk to memory. So one thing this is one thing. Another thing. So we didn't I didn't want to invent anything here. So since I mean LS, LSM is a great technology and RocksDB is one of the best implementations of it. We just used RocksDB in a in a somewhat unusual way because one thing that RocksDB does well. Um, is, uh, so first of all, it's partitioned. You can actually create multiple partitions in your, um, in your uh, files. So, and by 
um, adjusting the number of partitions, increasing the number of partitions, you can actually control how expensive the merges are. Yes, you would need to do more merges because you have multiple partitions, but you can control how, how long each merge is. So this is one thing that RocksDB does well. Another thing that RocksDB does well, but we didn't need it, RocksDB manages the uh, memory. So RocksDB does not assume that you never ever read from disk while the database is running. So they have a quite sophisticated memory manager that uh, uh, serves the pages from memory, but we didn't need it. What And what we ended up doing is that we configured the RocksDB with very little memory. It We only gave it enough memory so that it can do uh, uh, reasonably efficient merges. And for reasonably efficient mer merges, you don't really, really need much memory because the way the uh, uh, LSM does the merges, it does it just read essentially does sequential reads of the sequential reads and writes of the levels, right? And if it's a sequential read and or write, then read buffer that is small enough is still still allows you a pretty efficient algorithms here. We never. Since uh, the Gaia database never asks uh, uh, RocksDB to deliver data when the database is running, this allow I mean, this whole thing about separating the in-memory from the on-disk and plus the fact that it's in in-memory database, it allows us to use this dirty tree. And it just worked really well. And, and, the, 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 and the most importantly, the whole thing was very simple. So this part was very simple. Just yours truly, I was just, I, I was the first engineer in Gaia, who joined Gaia. I actually built this system and it took me like two months, right? Uh, without persistence. In order to add persistence, it took another two or three weeks. And the end result was that it was, it was very easy to use database. It was reasonably fast. I mean, it's not the fastest database, of course, because the the fact that you need to manage this memory and every time you start a transaction, there is a processing world here that sets up this memory in the way that uh, that allows you this uh, uh, transactional semantics. And it's not cheap. It takes uh, a few microseconds in the best case scenario. And if you have a really large a, a, a footprint in memory, if you have 100 gigabytes or so, it might take, I don't know, maybe 50 microseconds. I don't remember the exact numbers now. So a single uh, thread uh, uh, transaction rate, it could be somewhere between uh, 20,000 transactions per second to, I don't know, uh, 10,000 transactions per second, depending on the size of your uh, uh, um, uh, database of, of your working set, right? However, it scales really well because you can have uh, uh, multiple threads running simultaneously and uh, until you hit the limits, uh, um, until you hit the first limit when suddenly multiple threads are servicing multiple transactions, it scales pretty, linear, pretty much linearly. So we were able to, on a simple system, eight core or 16 core, I don't remember, uh, we were able to drive the throughput to hundreds of transactions, hundreds of thousands of transactions per second, which is very good. I mean, it's not it's not the best, of course, but it's it's not bad at all. So um, yeah, I I think we're out of time. There is not much more left here, and there are a bit, bit more details about how exactly the transaction commit happens and what happens in the uh, transaction begin, but um, I mean, I, it, it's just the details. It, it won't change any essence that we talked about so far. So I guess this is it. Okay, awesome. So I'll I'll, I'll clap and have everyone. Uh, we have one or two questions from the audience. Uh, Krita, you, you want to go first? She's still here. Sorry. Uh, I think she bounced. Uh, her question was. Um, 
I mean, is the core intuition, I guess, motivation of Gaia that you just want to provide better APIs for embedded devices over shared memory? And that's sort of my main question too. It sounds like these embedded people that want to build these IoT devices, they don't want to write SQL down to SQL byte or pick whatever engine you want, but they are, you know, embedded data is the one that they want to write in a, you know, object-oriented programming language like this. It's not an ORM. And that's that's the core motivation behind behind Gaia. Uh, yes, so uh, that that's the core motivation behind Gaia, correct? Uh, and uh, it, it, Gaia also attempts to bring uh, uh, the power of declarative programming to the masses, so to speak. Two two things: declarative programming uh, and uh, transactions done in the way that is, that are uh, friendly to people who don't want to learn databases, don't want to learn. Uh, uh, SQL and so forth. So this is the main motivation, uh, one of the main motivations, right? Uh, yes. Because in my in my experience, I, I I built my first database application thirty years ago, and I can tell you that uh, I had to learn a lot. Um, when I when I joined Microsoft, I and when I interacted with application developers, what I've noticed is that the um, the uh, qualification of the application, the de database application developers, it gradually declined. Not because people are not as smart as they used to be, but, but uh, there are a lot more people that are doing databases now. And they have a lot less time to actually, uh, uh, to actually learn things because everyone is under pressure to build applications faster. And uh, yes, sure, if you know your tool, for instance, your database really, really well, you can do more efficient applications. But I mean, it's, it's not always the, the most optimal thing to do, spend five years learning it and knowing it. And in the end, you, you're an expert and you can quickly write applications. But in those five years, you could have written tons of applications perhaps not the best applications, but they work, right? The, the, the mm -hmm. applications that would work. So, and we have the community of engineers, the embedded engineers who really uh, um, are conservative in this sense. They don't, they tend to uh, stick to low level languages. I mean, if you are writing a DSP, if you're writing device drivers, C, C++ are, are your typical tools, right? And you are really expert. And you don't want, you probably don't want, or you don't have time to spend on learning something new. And this was an attempt to make sure that whatever you need to learn is very little of it. Got it. And so the one data, I think it was similar to sort of that vision was like stream DB. Um, they're down in, um, and they're a bit older, but they're, same thing, they want to run on really small devices and they think they expose uh, like a C++ API.